This Nissan Aria just completed an absolutely epic journey. We'll learn more about it and talk to the drivers next. Husband and wife adventurers Chris and Julie Ramsey just trekked all the way from the North Pole, the realm of Santa Claus of course, down to the South Pole in Antarctica, a distance of some 21,000 miles and you guys did it all in a largely stock Nissan Aria. Yeah. Tell me more, this is an incredible story. <laughs> Thank you so much, I yeah. think, well, first of all, it's great to chat to you and shall we take a look at the car? Absolutely, because yeah. I've got a lot of questions about this thing. Cool. So, so what, what modifications, well, first of all, why drive from pole to pole? That's like <laughs> crazy. I would never think of attempting that. It's, it's all kind of an evolution because um, we've done various adventures for the last decade now in EVs. Um, the first, uh, first one was just like little road trips in the UK. And then we eventually progressed in 2017. We drove from London to Mongolia in a 30 kilo Agnes Sand Leaf, didn't we? Yes, we did. And then what? After we came back and from the Mongo Rally, you had bigger ideas, didn't you? Uh -huh. Yeah. Bigger I crazy ideas. Planted a seed and then that grew into, into this adventure, right? <laughs> I have right? no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already survived, so. Well, that's cool a thing. good thing then, right? Yeah, so I survived and thought, how can, how can I push the marriage a bit further? No, <laughs> we just thought, how can we take all those myths that are still surrounding EVs, mm -hmm. and the worries and concerns that some people have, and push that even further, and just debunk those myths. So the idea was to see, can we take them into the highest cold, to best, the worst cold mm -hmm. trains, heat, altitudes, everything, and just push the car technology Because you're going North America, Central America, South America, every terrain in between, yeah. deserts, yeah. Arctic conditions, mountains, plains, you rainforest, did you did it all. 14 countries, what, 10 months we did this, and wow. yeah, every terrain, as you've mentioned, from the extreme highs to like, what, nearly 50 degrees Celsius, Whew. to like minus yeah. 39 up in the Arctic, and that's excluding windshield. That's wind pretty chill. cold. Yeah, yeah. So bring some really thermal good. undergarments. <laughs> <laughs> to keep we frostbite at bay, right? <laughs> but let's talk about the vehicle it's, itself, because yeah. the powertrain underneath here is, is stock Nissan yeah. Aria, what anybody could get at a dealership. Exactly, so you're looking at a factory vehicle, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll move away from the 39-inch tires at yeah. the moment, but so basically the drivetrain, the suspension system, the battery is as you buy it from the factory. Just so with those car, with those tires, oh sorry, with this drivetrain system, the idea is to take a stock vehicle and show yep. a stock vehicle can do this. Correct. In essence, the, the, um, the suspension system hasn't been modified, it hasn't it's, been modified. It's factory suspension system as well. Okay. So if you think this vehicle, it does is not look like that would be factory. No, and that's where the uh, the work of Arctic, the specialist work of Arctic trucks in Iceland come in. All those big jacked up vehicles, big tied vehicles you see mm. in Iceland. These that's guys what made they do. this. Yeah, so they modified the wheel arches to effectively accommodate those 39 inch tires. Yeah. Because they are massive. And yeah. the reason why we have these big tires is um, we wouldn't be able to drive without them in the polar regions. Mm. Um, you need them for the snow. Otherwise, if we had normal sized tires, we'd just get constantly stuck and bogged down. So the 39 inch actually um, deflated, by the way, uh -huh. it has to be deflated, allowed us to traverse over those polar regions. Fascinating. So fascinating. we ran at the lowest up there, we ran about 4 PS side tire pressure. Wow. So the idea is the, the flat pancake tires, they displace a lot of, or pretty much all the way in the vehicle, mm -hmm. but it also gives you really good traction in that snow and ice. And the gotcha. best way I would describe it is like extreme polar off-roading because there's no roads up there. It's no. just wilderness. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're paving our own pathway to the magnetic North Pole and it's like even though it's the Arctic, it's different types of terrain. You've got the frozen smooth lakes, you've got the pressure yeah. kind of ridges in the sea, frozen sea ice. It's just so varying, even up in that region, and it was challenging. Oh, absolutely. And the, you know, and it was really good to take an EV up there to challenge the car and to see. Just demonstrate what is possible. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, you know. we'll get to charging and logistics in just a second, yeah. but tight, stock suspension, stock drivetrain different wheels and tires, obviously, yeah. fender flares. Any changes inside the vehicle, since we're along the side yeah. here? Is, is it stock as well? Absolutely stock. Yeah, look if at that, went, zero gravity factory, seats. It. <laughs> it's, um, it's stock, it's stock areas interior, because again, we need comfort. This is 10 months of our life living in this car. Yeah. And we're, a lot of times we're confined within this car when we're charging in remote locations, we've got nowhere to go. So we're living in that. The only interior modification we made was in the back of the car, we fitted a, a battery system. Uh -huh. Um, which powered charging devices and also powered um, our coffee machine as well. You need coffee. I need EVs coffee. are a lot quieter than some of the other vehicles yeah, in the garage here, right? Off. But let's swing around the front because I did notice 
and at the back as well. Yeah. We do have some other modifications. I assume this is in the, the off chance that you get stuck and need to be pulled out. We'll just yeah, so we have it. three tow hitches in yeah. the front and the back of the vehicle. And a, we, a very common question is, what are those for? And yeah. we've used them for jacking up the car. Yeah. Um, so you can work underneath it. Uh -huh. So you can. Um, so that's one of the reasons. And the second reason is if we do get a little bit bogged down and need a bit of a pull to get out, you would just put a tow hitch in the front and pull easy. us out. Very and um, obviously those are welded into the chassis. They're very strong. Um, but yeah, if you look at most of the Arctic trucks modified vehicles for the polar regions, they all mm. have that. So it's a standard feature for... So 21,000 odd miles in total. Yeah. Uh, how many problems did you have getting stuck, flat tires? Give us an idea of what the journey was like, because you're going over all <laughs> kinds of terrain, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual reliability of the vehicle, and breakdowns. Mm -hmm. The only breakdown we had in the Arctic was literally not a breakdown. I think I, I hit a rock, didn't I, in the, in the snow? <laughs> so, as the, he hit a rock in no. the snow. But to it's be hidden fair, under the snow, snow and ice, right? Yeah. But to be fair, yeah. obviously it's snow. There was a rock underneath. You couldn't see it. Yeah. So. We bumped down on it. Yeah. Okay. And what it did was it damaged the, um, the one of the suspension arms in the in the car. Okay. So the guys, Arctic trucks, basically just jacked the car up on this side and just changed Swapped the part, it out. job done. Yeah. 30 minutes, we're Easy. on the way again. But again, Wonderful. it's another reason why we needed a support team, because we're not that mechanics. That was my next question. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we're not mechanics, so if there's any, like, those type of um, repairs or um, that needed to be done, unfortunately, we're not um, competent enough to do that, so. You're the our, driver and navigator getting. Precisely, exactly. Not precisely, getting lost. Precisely. So what is, the, what is the support team like that enabled this? Because I don't imagine there are a lot of Electrify America stations along the route. Yeah, so in, in the Arctic and Antarctic, it was Arctic trucks. These yeah. are the polar expedition experts. So they, they were trying new vehicles for the Arctic, and that was um, for the, uh, there was F-350s. Mm -hmm. So we had two F-350s within the Arctic, and in Antarctica, they're traditional vehicles, which is Toyota Hiluxes. And the idea behind that as well is when you're going into these regions to do an expedition, you need, you one, you have to have support. It's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But also to get sign off an agreement to be in these regions, you need to have experience and knowledge. And as we said, we're not mechanics, we're yeah. not polar expedition people. Yeah. So the only way we can get permission to be there is with Arctic trucks and their support. And you have to be supported by proven technology at this time. And at the moment, this is to demonstrate that this is could be proven technology for these regions. Um, but at the moment, it's not. So that was one of the elements of our expedition is to demonstrate it can be. So we had to be supported by traditional fossil fuel vehicles. So basically, a, I'm assuming a diesel generator to charge the battery. It was a, a fire, uh, sorry, a seven kilowatt petrol generator. Okay. And in the Arctic, we had a five kilowatt wind turbine system, hybrid system. Uh -huh. And then in Antarctica, we had solar panels. So we had a hybrid solar panel okay. system. So a variety of different ways of charging exactly. the battery. We were testing new technology there, weren't we? Yeah. And between Yellowknife and Punta Arenas, it was just Chris and I. We had no support. So we were relying on public charging infrastructure, okay. which is widely available in Canada and America. Yes. Um, Not too much of a problem through no. North America. Well, we had <laughs> Until, challenges, but well, um, that's a, a conversation <laughs> for another day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then when there were gaps, um, which we couldn't, we didn't have enough charge to reach the next public charger, we would rely on the kindness of strangers okay. to help us plug in our car. So we had like a whole array of different plug types with us. Okay, adapters and everything. Per, yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that allowed us to kind of continue our journey in those areas where there were gaps. But one of the things we had in South America, we had one of the leg, we want to do adventures with purpose. Mm -hmm. So we're demonstrating Cable's VV technology, but in South America, we worked with NLX Way yeah. to install chargers along our route in South America. So we're putting network in the ground. So you're helping build out the infrastructure exactly. then with this journey. So we journey. want to leave some Something behind. So when we finish the expedition, there's charges in the ground throughout the, throughout the whole of South America so people can now drive EVs in those countries. And they're still fledgling, but they've got the ability to have charges already for when they do start bringing more EVs into, that, into those regions. How effective was the heater? You spent a lot of time, time in the polar regions. Did you freeze or, did, or <laughs> what? You answered that one for the Arctic. <laughs> Yeah, someone didn't really let me put the heating on up in the Arctic. Ooh. Well, you got to preserve the battery life, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that was our own choice. There yeah. wasn't anything wrong with the heater at all, of the, the car's function yeah, yeah. of the heater. It was just someone's personal choice not to, because we want to maximize the range of, of the course. car. We want of to get course. as far as we can. And obviously, heating is a big drain to our uh, battery, as we know. But, um, but yeah, but 
we had come up with some solutions for Antarctica mm -hmm. um, that allowed us to have the heating on in Antarctica. Okay. Not all the time, and if we did, it was kind of about 18 degrees, yep. 16 to 18 degrees, so it did take the chill off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the heating worked. It was just personal choice whether we gotcha. would have it on or off. Basically, in, in, our, in the Arctic, there's, minim there's minimal drain on batteries now with regards to the, how efficient the heating systems mm -hmm. become, I would say, but for us, every 0.5% uh -huh. counts and yes, that was a difference yes. so we kind of made that decision to kind of maximize that range and that well, the good thing about the Aria has got a heated um, steering wheel yes and the seats too and I would imagine the seats are heated so yeah. they were lifesavers for yeah. us because um, that directly heat... warms your body then yeah, you're not exactly. using the, yeah. the rest of the so, HVAC you know, system so you know that and a blanket over you kept us warm when the heating <laughs> wasn't on Gotcha. Sorry. Well, yeah. you know when the heating's off, the car literally freezes inside. I wouldn't doubt it, yeah. <laughs> it's freaking cold out there. Um, how did you guys get to Antarctica? I mean, you, I mean aren't, is there permitting involved? What does Absolutely. it take to go there and, and drive? So if you want to do an expedition in Antarctica, first of all, you need experience yeah. in Antarctic expeditions. If you don't have it, you can't go in. Um, and that's where, again, like I said, we had Arctic trucks. So yeah. they gave us our permit to go in. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, to get into Antarctica. Union Glacier, the, the camp where you get every private expedition goes from, the only way to access that is by plane. So you have to fly in, mm -hmm. you drive to South Pole, which is still, we did 788 miles to the pole, uh -huh. and turn around and come back again, because you can only be extracted from the same place uh -huh. you came in. So we came back out of Union Glacier, so um, Fascinating. It, was, it was a flight in, basically. Yeah. Absolutely epic journey, sounds like it was probably challenging, but also a lot of fun. Last question though, yeah. what, well, two part question. What was the biggest challenge and would you do this again? Mm. <laughs> Big, little contentious question me. maybe. Biggest challenge, yeah. I mean, first of all, this, yeah. the answer to the second question for me is yes, in a heartbeat. Yeah. I, I love this because it educates people and it, and it shows people what's possible. Yeah. But I think it gives me a bit of purpose in life as well if I can help people out. And the second thing is, biggest challenge for me, absolutely the Arctic because we were learning everything mm. there and that was our, pr our training ground for Antarctica so we learned so much there outside of the knowledge we already had we learned a lot more up in that region for me yeah. yeah I think the biggest challenge as well is just the timeline even though it was 10 months we were still on a deadline weren't we with regards yeah. to schedule and obviously I just, as Chris mentioned about the Arctic we yeah. had a timeline to get out of the Arctic because the oh, ice the road permitting. oh the ice the road ice yeah. was yeah. melting a lot oh, quicker yeah. than we had anticipated yeah. therefore we had to get out quicker so it created a lot of pressure so um, the polar regions definitely was the most challenging yeah. and well, would I do it again? Definite, definite maybe definite, definite yes. maybe well definite awesome I'm yes. glad you guys cool. made it I'm glad the vehicle survived and I wish you the best of luck should you do it again yeah cool yeah. thank, thank you so you. much yes, thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we just had our own huge adventure in a Nissan Aria. Click over here to see if we can hit all five Great Lakes in just 24 hours.